male, therefore you gain that privilege. I get a lot of privilege from the impression of me and from the uh, my expression of myself, which it was not intentional. I didn't like set out to decide that I was going to try to be, try to sound white, or try to sound like your average thing. I was brought up that way. That's how I was trained, and that was what I was around, and that those were the influences that I took in my crafting of my self-expression. Um, any other form of self-expression, I won't say it would have seemed false, but it, it would have been as false as this one in the sense that I, or it would have been slightly more false, I guess you would say, than this one because I would have been saying, okay, here, here's the, here is my set of influences, but I'm going to just pick this one, this little group right here, this little slice of my influences, and, and go that way and present myself in accordance with that. Had I been raised differently, that balance would have been different. But the way I was raised, the people I was raised around, uh, the uh, everything that I got ended up coming through me like this. And this is my presentation. So um, I, I have that privilege. I have white privilege. But at the same time, I don't necessarily fit that demographic. I don't feel comfortable in, in your average white group of people. Like you get a group of white people together, whatever that means. Uh, whiteness as a, as a practice rather than whiteness as an ethnicity. Maybe I have to go through this again. See, there are a lot of things that, one problem with having done this show for a long time and done a lot of these shows for a long time is that I will define terms at some point and say, okay, here's what we're talking about here. And then years go by and I haven't explain that definition to anybody since then. So while at the time I defined these terms and it was clear what I was talking about, now it may not be so clear. So white as an ethnicity, if we can call it that, and whiteness as a practice are two different things. Whiteness as a practice is, the, is what I'm doing here, essentially, I, uh, in, in my presentation. My presentation is whiteness. But my words, the, the concepts that I endeavor to share with you, they don't fit into the practice of whiteness. So it becomes very complex. Um, I present white, I guess you would say, um, ethnically speaking, if someone were to say, okay, what, what group does this person right here should stand in which ethnic group? They say, oh, white people. So that's my visual presentation. Uh, if they listen to me speak um, without paying too much attention to the words, but just listen to me talk, listen to me, listen to me express myself uh, on topics like weather and uh, you know things like that, then they'll say, oh, definitely white. It goes over there. Um, but whiteness as a practice, is more what this person is talking about when, when they talk about the white settler colonists or white supremacy or all that stuff. That's whiteness. That's whiteness as a, as a uh, we have defined ourselves as being white and we are taking, making action to support, protect that status for ourselves. Anyway, I'm getting way off. I'm getting way off the subject here. But uh, anyway, these there there's so many layers to this stuff, and, and I feel if there's a, a flaw in this article that I'm reading here, there are, I would say there's two of them. One of them is everything is expressed in very absolute, hardcore terms, uh, unflinchingly so, without. Uh, any acknowledgement that some of these truths might be hard to hear 
or this might be the most extreme way of expressing this this truth that you can come up with. And the other is <clears throat> would be that it's it's using terms without really explaining them all the time. And it's lumping people in, well, okay, it's three of them. Lumping people into groups and just kind of calling it a day. You are part of this group. Period. You're locked in there. You're stuck in that. There, there's no uh, context for your participation. That you just are there. And uh, but as we know from the study of intersectionality, people are affected by multiple groups. People are members of multiple groups, and so it is difficult to define someone easily unless they go out of their way to portray themselves you know there are some people that are part of a group and try really hard to embrace that group membership and they uh, actively promote that group and and sort of prune their behavior and their expressions to fit into that group in, in which case yeah you're a full-fledged member but <laughs> uh, that's a different thing most people are a little more complex than that. All right, moving on, back to our story. Yet the genesis of the first full-fledged settler state in the world went beyond its predecessors. In 1492, Iberia and British colonized Ireland with an economy based on land sales and enslaved African labor and the implementation of the fiscal military state. Both the liberal and right-wing versions of the national narrative misrepresent the process of European colonization of North America. Both narratives serve the critical function of preserving the official story of a mostly benign and benevolent United States as an anti-colonial movement that overthrew British colonialism. The pre-U.S. independent settlers were colonial settlers just as they were in Africa and India or like the Spanish in Central and South America. The nation of immigrants myth erases the fact that the United States was founded as a settler state from its inception and spent the next hundred years at war against the native nations in conquering the continent. Buried beneath the tons of propaganda from the landing of the English pilgrims, Protestant Christian evangelicals, to James Fenimore Cooper's phenomenally popular The Last of the Mohicans, claiming settlers' natural rights not only to be indigenous people's territories, but also to the territories claimed by other European powers, is the fact that the founding of the United States created a division of the Anglo Empire, with the U.S. becoming a parallel empire to Great Britain, ultimately overcoming it. From day one, as was specified in the Northwest Ordinance, which preceded the U.S. Constitution, the new Republic for Empire, as Thomas Jefferson called the new United States, envisioned the future shape of what is now the 48 states of the continental United States. The founders drew up rough maps specifying the first territory to conquer as the Northwest Territory. That territory was the Ohio Valley and the Great Lakes region, which was already populated with indigenous villages and farming communities thousands of years old. Even before independence, mostly Scots-Irish settlers had seized indigenous farmlands and hunting grounds in the Appalachians and are revered historically as first settlers and rebels who in the mid-20th century began claiming indigeneity. Ah, this is complicated. There's a lot here. The narrative of the nation of immigrants also excludes the history of enslaved Africans who were hauled in chains thousands of miles from their villages and fields, naked and with no belongings, and forcibly denied not only their freedom, but also their languages, customs, histories, and nationalities. Not only were they used as forced and unpaid labor, but their very bodies were legally private property to be bought and sold, soon creating a thriving legal domestic slave market which by 1840 was of greater monetary value than all other property combined, including all the gold in circulation, all bank reserves, and all real estate. 
the Cotton Kingdom was the fiscal military center of U.S. capitalist development with the industrial production of cotton, giving rise to a permanent racial capitalism even after legalized slavery ended. Plantation owners and managers maintained a military-like counterinsurgency to control the enslaved workers, often calling in the U.S. Army to quell insurrections. During Reconstruction, following the Civil War, Ku Klux Klan terrorism against black political and economic power was the result of the inadequacy of the U.S. Army occupation of the former Confederate states. Army divisions were being shifted west of the Mississippi to destroy native nations and seize the rest of the continent. With the end of the occupation, Jim Crow segregation laws gave rise to a form of policing that spread in the 20th century to major urban areas as African Americans fled the South, and that continues in the 21st century. The 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution ratified after the Civil War changed all white citizenship to include those African Americans freed from enslavement, although still male only. But continued segregation, discrimination, and police killings creating a kind of content contingency of full citizenship. Anglo settlers seized the agricultural lands of indigenous peoples of the southeast for plantation agribusiness in cotton and importing enslaved people from the original slave states for the grueling labor. One group of U.S. slavers moved into the Mexican province of Texas soon after the Mexican people won back their decade-long war for independence from Spain. The two-year U.S. military invasion of Mexico that began in 1846 finally seized Mexico City in 1848. Under U.S. occupation, the Mexican government, through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, was forced to relinquish the northern half of its territory. What became the states of California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Texas were then opened to Anglo settlement and in the process legalizing those Anglo slavers in Texas who had already settled there illegally. The indigenous nations in the seized territory, the Apache, Navajo, Kiowa, and Comanche, resisted U.S. conquest for decades as they had resisted the Spanish Empire. The small class of Hispano elite in New Mexico had welcomed and collaborated with U.S. occupation, which led to late 20th century Hispano claims of indigeneity while living on lands their ancestors had forcibly taken from the indigenous pueblos. This then was another site of the fiscal military state and racial capitalism taking hold to contribute to U.S. imperial dominance. Meanwhile, the English colonization of Ireland led to the 1840s famine and the first mass migration to the United States. The Irish refugees were mostly Catholic and despised by the majority U.S. Anglo-Protestants, but they quickly became the nation's second largest European national group, a political force which, with which to be reckoned. Many settled in urban slums and had few skills, having been agricultural workers. They took whatever unskilled jobs they could find, the men and boys working on the docks, pushing carts, digging canals, and constructing the railroad, and obtaining work as slave patrollers in the Cotton Kingdom and early urban police forces. Women worked as housekeepers and nannies, in factories and often in sex work. How subsequent generations of Irish Americans became settlers, even one one of their own ascendancy to the presidency in 1960 is a tragic story. As well, the nearly cult-like formation of 20th century urban police forces and the Federal Bureau of Investigation drew on Irish recruits until they became dominant and de definitive as police. Racialized urban policing increasingly became a major component of the fiscal military state. Then there were European immigrants, mostly Catholic and Jewish, who were considered not quite white. During the 1880s alone, more than 5 million Central and Eastern Europeans arrived in search of jobs in burgeoning industrial and mining sites in the Northeast, Midwest, and West. Excuse me. Many Jewish immigrants were fleeing pogroms, while other immigrants, particularly German, were driven out 
excuse me again, by political repression and brought with them strong organizational experience that was so socialistically inclined. The immigrant-driven workers' movements forced the reformulation of industrial capitalism, but their status as immigrants made them vulnerable to political deportation in the early 20th century. During that period, Italian immigrants arrived, mostly from southern Italy. Suffering the stigma of being Catholic and also dark-complected, they were subjected to extreme discrimination. Italians and other Catholic immigrants became Americanized and accepted as white through the Roman Catholic Church and a process rooted in the myth of Columbus, especially with the 1882 founding of the Knights of Columbus and the subsequent 400-year anniversary of Columbus's first landing in the Caribbean. This, too, was another self-indigenizing process, with the Catholic Columbus being positioned as the original founding father of the United States. The origins and staying power of the Western panic against Asian immigrants moved from medieval Europe to the U.S. Chinese Exclusion Act of May 6, 1882 and into the 21st century. All European U.S. trade unions were corrupted and weakened by their anti-Chinese bigotry and support for barring Chinese workers, which accelerated the spread of yellow peril racism. In Oakland, California, socialist union activist and celebrity writer Jack London was amongst the loudest voices spewing hatred. Yellow peril suspicions also led to the internment of U.S. citizens of Japanese descent under the liberal Franklin Roosevelt administration. Fear of Asians in general, and of the Chinese in particular, persists today with the U.S. reaction to China's economic development. Ah, there's a lot here. Since the early 20th century, immigrant hating in the United States is primarily about Mexicans, not Latinos in general, and is directly related to the unsettled border established in 1848 when the U.S. annexed half of Mexico. The fact that a third of the continental territory of the United States today was brutally annexed through a war of conquest is inscribed on that international border. The Cold War against Mexico has never ended, and the border is an open wound. There is a history of U.S. aggression against Mexico and Mexicans, militarily and economically, as well as ideologically, from Walt Whitman to Patrick Buchanan and Trump. In fact, the United States is responsible for the waves of refugees from Latin American countries due to imperialism, who are then criminalized and their children deported, dispersed, and even lost in the ongoing situation at the U.S.-Mexico border. <sighs> what, then, is the position of immigrants in a settler state? One of the unspoken requirements for immigrants and their descendants to become fully American has been to participate in anti-black racism and to aspire to whiteness. There we have that term, finally. With the post-Second World War work of civil rights, black power, and other anti-racist movements, whiteness lost much of its desirability for several generations. This process coincided with and influenced the 1965 immigration reform law that removed restrictions on immigration that had been in effect since the 1924 immigration law, which limited immigration to Western Europeans. Thereby, since the late 1960s, greater numbers of immigrants have come from the global south, mostly from formerly colonized countries, and many of them refugees from civil wars or U.S. instigated wars in their countries. The new immigrants are more likely than past immigrants to be college graduates or professionals. They often experience racism and othering in their daily lives, and for Muslims in particular, virulent, virulent, I keep saying that word wrong, virulent hostility, which for some leads to solidarity with anti-racist movements. How they as immigrants experience and react to settler colonialism varies, with some becoming dedicated to solidarity with native peoples, resistance, while most remain indifferent or even negate the demands of indigenous communities and the reality of settler colonialism. Although immigrants from Asia, Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean are not pressured to become white, 
as immigrants were in the past, they do automatically become settlers unless they resist that default. Anti-racism and diversity are widely accepted, but the problem is the general denial or refusal to acknowledge settler colonialism. As Mahmoud Mamdami observes, the thrust of American struggles has been to deracialize, but not to decolonize. A deracialized America still remains a settler society and a settler state. Mm. So, oh, this is by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. Hmm. Okay, so that that was a lot, and uh, and again, you know, to sum up, that was pretty harsh in terms of how it describes the U.S. And this is where a lot of uh, Republicans or Trumpites or whoever uh, get their, oh, these people hate America. And America, by the way, is, is a misnomer because <laughs> there's North America, South America, Central America. I mean, calling it America at all is, is a colonial thing, but calling the United States America is even more just saying, Hey, none of the rest of this even matters. So anyway, but you, you already know that. So uh, this is what a lot of people are talking about. Like if you read this, as I did, <laughs> or you listen to me reading this, as you did, uh, you'll say, well, these people just hate America. That's all. That's what it boils down to. They hate us. They want you to hate us. They, they're not trying to teach you real history. They're trying to teach you to hate us. Um, and in the sense that the us being described are settler colonists, yes, you should hate that. You should hate that mentality because, you know, <clears throat> if we hadn't done that pivot to that nation of immigrants thing uh, back in the 50s, at some point, we would have had to reckon with the fact that we were not that different from Great Britain or France uh, or Germany. They started a long time before we did. So, you know, Britain colonized places around the world. The sun never sets on the British Empire. Remember that? Uh, they colonized places just overtly. There wasn't even... A, a, you know, an attempt to make it seem like it was okay. Um, and that's the French were doing it. I mean, there was a whole period in history where, you know, these European states were going around collecting colonies, basically around the world, conquering and colonized settler. It, well, but here's the difference. They were colonies, but they weren't settler colonists. They didn't necessarily want to live there. They just wanted to control it. It was an economic thing. Um, the difference in the United States was these were people coming over here wanting to live here. So they didn't want to just colonize this territory. They wanted to own it. They wanted to take it. And that was the difference in the way the U.S. became a colonial power and the other countries. And that's, that's where the confusion has been throughout. That's why it's, uh, I won't say be, been easy, but why it's been possible to reframe um, the, the narrative around the U.S. versus, say, Britain going to India. British weren't trying, they didn't want to live in India. They would wanted the riches, they wanted the spices, they wanted all that stuff from India to flow back to Britain. And they wanted to control that area as a territory. You belong to us, you can do your thing otherwise, but we get all the money. We just want to harvest the money. It was a strictly financial thing for the most part. <clears throat> when the British came to the U.S., I don't know if they just had a new idea that was slightly different uh, from the colonial regimes in the past, or maybe it was just because they were coming from Britain to this place, 
and saying, well, you know, we're either going to colonize this for Mother England, if you want to call it that, or hey, how about we just start our own country? So I think it was more, it was as much opportunism as anything else, but it was a, a, a thing of like, hey, we've got this place. We don't have to do this for uh, the country that we came from. We can do it for ourselves. We'll own it ourselves. And so that's where settler colonialism came from, or at least where it came from in this instance, uh, where this particular version of it came from. And um, so that difference has made it possible for Canada and the U.S. in particular, and probably some other countries as well that I'm not thinking of at the moment, to sort of tinker with and reframe their history so that it doesn't seem like the same thing. It doesn't seem like what was going on in India with the British or in Guyana with the French or uh, South Africa with the Dutch. Uh, you know, it's it seemed like a different thing. Uh, maybe South Africa was actually an attempt. I don't know. I have to do some research on that because that may have been an attempt by them to do the same thing that uh, people were doing in the U.S., be that as it may, I'm, I'm not an expert. I've actually run out of time. But I think about this stuff. You know, I admit that these were strong words and they were very brutally stated uh, facts, but they were facts, and they are facts. And that is so much closer to the reality, the truth and reality of the history of the United States than all the sanitized, uh, nationalistic, patriotic versions that you've read, I'm sorry, but it's true. And it's hard to get used to. And it leaves a lot of questions for like, what do we do about it? Okay, it's happened. What do we do now? How do we undo the bad parts? Can we undo the bad parts? Uh, I mean, some obviously we can't. We can't undo generations of slavery and, and genocide, but can we fix it? Or do we have to just start from here and try to make something um, better than what we started with? What do we do? Those are big questions and those are, are really great questions. Uh, they are beyond the scope of this show, certainly, so I'm not going to attempt to try and, and answer those questions myself here, but they're things that we should all think about. Uh, it is incumbent upon us to think about it because we live here, because we are inheritors of this state, of this system, and we have to think, moving forward, how do we move forward in a good way and do it properly? And so certainly one way is to repudiate the people that are trying to, uh, you know, reconstitute and, and re-glorify the settler colonial beginnings of this country, we have to just push back against that absolutely because we can't go back to that. We can't say that was good. Let's keep it. Anyway, I've got to go. I ran out of time. Thank you for listening. This has been CU Immigration here on WRFU LP Urbana 104.5 and UPTV. We'll see you again sometime. Bye-bye. 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 See you again sometime.